Okay, it looks like we have just about everybody in. Uh, again, welcome to today's uh, webinar on ransomware trends for 2018. My name is Pete Amborn. I am with DWD Technology Group, and I'll give you some contact information on the very last slide today. Uh, just a little housekeeping. Most of you have probably been in on webinars before, so you know this uh, is not going to be anything new. Everyone is muted, otherwise it gets very, very confusing. If you have questions, uh, I ask if you would save them to the end. This is only 25 minutes or so presentation. Uh, if we get uh, sidetracked on some during the presentation, that may go a lot longer than that. So if you would, um, please hold those to the end. You can submit them during, but I'm just kind of forewarning you that I'm not really watching the questions uh, section in the GoToWebinar interface uh, closely until the very end. Also, you're more than welcome to email me. I will get back to every single email. Uh, whether I have an answer or not, <laughs> I will respond. If I don't have an answer right away, uh, I will at least let you know that I'm going to have to do uh, maybe some research in some cases. So here's what we're going to cover. Uh, there'll actually be one thing after this, uh, time permitting, and that will be uh, some positive things <laughs> that are coming down the pipe for 2018. Hate to end on a negative note with all this uh, talk of attacks, uh, but these are the main six that I'll be hitting on today. Number one is no big surprise, uh, more of the same that we saw in 2017, 2016, even some that are still around from 2014. They're not going anywhere. As long as money is being made, uh, the attackers are going to keep using them. So I'll go over that, but I'll keep that brief uh, since the gist of this webinar is, is trends to look forward to uh, in the future. The second is a continued rise of what's called um, RAS or ransomware as a service. And I will detail exactly what that is here shortly. Escalated mobile attacks. I think uh, a few friends of mine have already started to see these. Uh, they're, it's not widely uh, available to attackers yet. You will see more and more of these this year and, and definitely in 2019 and on. Outsource protection. Uh, this is mainly for companies, small, mid-size that aren't doing it yet. Large companies tend to already be doing this, but outsourcing protection just because of the, uh, the volume and the variety of tax that uh, people are starting to see. Number five, you may have seen this phrase uh, already out in the media. If you haven't, you will. <laughs> IOT stands for Internet of Things, and basically that means anything connected to the Internet. That used to be just computers, then it moved to computers and phones, then computers and tablets, and now, of course, you have thermostats, refrigerators, watches, cameras, just about everything you can imagine. Toasters I saw recently, uh, people are scrambling to get them connected to the Internet. And number six, you're going to see a much wider variety of attacks. Things, uh, even just, uh, although we're talking just about ransomware here, the variety of the ransomware that's coming in and how they're trying to extract money or cause damage will change quite a bit. So the first topic, uh, more of the same. Here are some of the really big attacks from 2017. Uh, these are the ones that have the largest numbers, made the most impact uh, as far as how many people were hit and were in the news the most. Now, I, I kind of hesitate to give these uh, when I'm mainly talking to small and mid-sized businesses because at times this can kind of kind of give a false bit of comfort. People think, uh, not me, it's not going to happen. It's absolutely not the case. Um, I'll talk about that uh, towards the end of the slide. But some of the big ones that you probably saw in the news, the Equifax breach, obviously very scary because tons of people use that, even if they don't realize they're using it. Uh, over 145 million people had some form of data released. In some cases, it was Social Security numbers. Uh, some cases, it may have been passwords, uh, different bits of data, but it, it affected quite a few people. Uh, WannaCry, uh, over 300,000 machines were hit, all kinds of industries. The main one, if I remember right, uh, was healthcare. And in Britain especially, there were hospitals that just had to close. They could not access patient records. So obviously, uh, very scary in there. Uh, Petya and Not Petya, uh, they renamed the, the Petya attack, Not Petya just to differentiate the 2017 attacks from what had come before. So really, it, it's kind of the same 
form of attack. The one that you may have seen in the news was FedEx. Um, they said they had close to $300 million worth of loss. One of their uh, subsidiaries, TNT Express, actually had to shut down for a while. So huge impact to them. And uh, the last one I threw in there, even though technically it's not, uh, was not 2017, but Uber admitted in 2017 that a 2016 attack had occurred. 57 million customers had some data um, put out on the web or taken. And initially Uber had paid over $100,000 just to kind of cover it up to get the stuff back and to have the uh, the ransomware people promise they weren't going to release anything, which of course you can't trust them. Uh, it, the very last paragraph there though is, is one I want to pull your attention to the most. Just because you see all these uh, big companies, those are the ones that make the news, but small and mid-sized businesses for those uh, types, the attacks tripled in 2017. That's huge. And just to kind of put a little bit of relevance on there in blue, you'll see one attack every two minutes in the first quarter, just two quarters later. So six months later, that increased every 40 seconds, there was an attack. Now this doesn't mean a successful attack, but that just means an attack. So the criminals are just amping it up. It's getting less and less expensive for them to attack, and it's getting easier for them to get their hands on the tools to do it. So these things, they're not going away. Uh, the last uh, sentence there, and you will have uh, access to these slide decks, uh, the slide deck later, so don't feel like you have to furiously uh, write anything down or take pictures with your phone or other things I've, I've heard people doing. Um, you will have access to this. And I try to, anything I've referenced from a site, I try to include it. So a lot of this information here is from Barclay.com. They do endpoint protection. Uh, it's not someone we particularly use, uh, but I do like um, their website and how they release news on different attacks. But they mentioned here in their last uh, sentence how consumers are still very popular because they're the least experienced, uh, the kind of low-hanging fruit, if you would. Uh, but they're accelerating their attacks against businesses. And as I said, criminals are, are getting very, very good at targeting specific companies. The rise of RAS and, and why you should even care about this. Um, ransomware as a service is basically programmers creating kits. And I know this sounds kind of science fiction-y, but it's absolutely the case. You can go out and see these. I've done it myself. Uh, but people who have very little or no programming experience can just go buy a kit from someone. And they're as little as $39. I've seen several sites <laughs> when they're fairly new and uh, use these to attack. And you put them in links to emails or on websites that you're publishing. There are all kinds of ways you can use the kits. And believe me, they're more than willing to help you in how you use them because they want to sell as many as they can. Uh, most of the sites will start off pretty cheap, around $39. And then I notice as they kind of tweak their tools and their tools get really good, they'll go up. But, but even when they go up, they're $300, $400. And the uh, hackers can make that back in very, very short order. Notice also uh, in the first kind of bullet point there in blue that sales of these kind of kits on the dark web have increased uh, from $400,000 in 2016, which is still a lot of money. Uh, but last year they went up to $6.25 million. And you can kind of do the math in your head. Um, at $39 or even $300 a kit, that's a lot of kits. They're also getting uh, kind of cute, if you will, on how they're trying to extract money from people. If you notice that computer monitor on the left-hand side, it's no longer just a case of where they will encrypt your files and it's all or nothing. Pay your $300, here are your files, maybe. Now they're doing things like um, a single file restore for $30. They'll even give you a couple free file restores just to prove to you that they can actually do what they're saying. And of course, it goes up from there. If you want a full restore, this particular one was asking for $120. Okay, so how are they making this money? And again, this is important to you because you can see what's out there on the web for these people to grab. This is a marketplace uh, screen, and this is where um, hackers, ransomware users can go to post and sell accounts that they've stolen. 
And hopefully you can read this. I know it's a little small, but um, I'll reference a few. Uh, Verizon Wireless is one where this, and this is an account for one particular uh, user. And they are selling 25 Verizon Wireless usernames and passwords for $12 a piece. And if you go down the list there, you'll see some other ones. I'm sure you'll recognize Target. Uh, there's another interesting one, Wells Fargo. They have nine accounts at $25 a piece. Now, these, these aren't very expensive. And um, what everyone is, is telling me is it's kind of hit or miss. So like with the Wells Fargo, somebody may buy a username and password. And by the time they try to use it, it's changed. But as most of you know, and most of you do, uh, people don't change their passwords drastically. They may add a number to the end. They may add a number at the beginning. They may capitalize the first letter. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the password's very similar to what they had before. So all someone has to do is get a hold of the username, obviously, is very important, typically your email address. Uh, and then they can go to town with some other tools to guess that password. But this is kind of shocking the first time I saw this at just how inexpensive these are which kind of makes you think, okay, again, how are they making all this money that we hear they're making? Well, on the next screen, for that same user that you saw on the previous screen, this is how many sales they've made, how many clients, and how much they've earned. So of those personal accounts they were selling, they've sold 35,000 of them to date, making just over $288,000. So tons of money. Uh, you'd have to extrapolate out, I guess, a little bit to figure out if they sold 35,000, how many they posted, how many are still out there. Uh, sometimes people like this, uh, if they didn't do the stealing themselves, will go out to a clearinghouse site and buy bulk accounts that have been stolen elsewhere, maybe in the Equifax breach. And then they'll sell them on sites like this. And the way that this is kind of ironic story, but the way the person uh, got these screenshots for this particular user is this user used the same username and password themselves on other sites. And so this person literally hacked into their account to get this information. Kind of funny. OK, another thing I think um, feel very strongly about attacks on mobile are just going to increase. If you haven't heard of these, you will most likely this year. Uh, one of the most popular is one called Leaker Locker, and I have that in blue there in the middle. And if you look at the uh, screenshot on the right hand side, that's an actual example of what you would see. It hasn't been populated yet with numbers. So if you if you look in the uh, parentheses where it says personal photos, normally that would have a number in there to to show you, hey, we've stolen 85 of your photos, 300 contact numbers, a uh, thousand text messages, your phone call history. And the really scary thing about this is it's not just um, in the past where they would have said we've encrypted it. Now you've lost it. Good luck getting it back. They've gone well beyond that now. They they have claimed and in most cases have taken it. And they are going to, if you can kind of squint and read that last paragraph, in less than 72 hours, they're going to send it to everybody that's in your telephone and email contact list. Now, for most people, that would, goes from annoying to embarrassing to horrible, depending on what kind of pictures, what kind of text you've sent, uh, what kind of phone call history, even your GPS location in some cases uh, for some people would be a big deal. Uh, so, so it's huge. And again, um, kind of strange, but they're not asking for a lot, $50. So it, it kind of tells you that they didn't spend a lot to make this attack and they're counting on volume. More companies are going to outsource protection. And this is an easy prediction to make. It, it's already coming true. It, it was coming true uh, towards the second uh, half, I'd say, of 2017. Um, but as all these attacks uh, are increasing in volume and complexity, there are companies that are offering services to try to fight back. And one of those is referred to as managed security services. And somebody that provides that, no surprise, managed security services provider or an MSSP. And they do a lot of the stuff for you. Um, they'll also supplement uh, for people that have an internal staff already or a person uh, that's kind of trying to fight this stuff and just finding out they're getting kind of in over their head at this point. 
uh, they'll reach out and have another company monitor it. Not unlike um, having your servers and workstations monitored. Uh, there are just so many logs. Uh, the volume's crazy to go through and to figure out what you should be paying attention to and what, what is just noise. Um, the top functions there, uh, CIO.com, Chief Information Officer, is a nice site I look at frequently. Um, they list the top functions being outsourced right now. And some of those, I won't hit on all these, you can read those later, but penetration testing is a biggie. Uh, basically, we have tools, other people have tools uh, that they can use to kind of test um, getting into your network from outside. And they'll see if there are open ports, if there are ports published that shouldn't be, um, any way of getting in. It's a very quick test that can be run, and a lot of people will have that run quarterly um, or semi-annually. Spam filtering, which I'm guessing most people are already doing. If you're not, definitely start. Uh, if you're on Office 365, that's being done for you automatically and at a pretty good level. <laughs> um, log monitoring, I mentioned huge volume of logs, though. It, it sounds great to say we're monitoring all of our logs, but once you see the thousands and thousands of logs that are generated every day, um, it just gets so overwhelming that a lot of people just quit looking. Uh, Anti-denial um, of service attacks for your firewalls, that gets a little complicated. Business continuity and disaster recovery, we still say is the number one defense uh, against ransomware. Hopefully you're already doing that. Uh, the bulk of ransomware still, uh, the attack vector is encrypt all the files, destroy whatever backups they can get their hands on, and then uh, make you pay. So the best thing you can have is a, is a really solid offline, off-site, where they can't get to it, backup that, from which you can restore files. And the last one here, I know I've spoken on a few other occasions, but this may be new to you, um, awareness training. There are several companies out there, uh, know before, I think it's K-N-O-W, B, the letter B, and then the number four. Uh, dot com is, a, is probably the most popular one right now, but they will actually do uh, online training for you and they'll send out test uh, spam emails to see if any of the users in your company uh, will click on those. And if they do, those users are directed to additional training. Um, and, and a lot of times right in the email, it will tell them as soon as they click on it, oops, no, you shouldn't have clicked on this and here's why. And just doing those at kind of an intermittent basis uh, keeps people on their toes. It's actually a really nice service. Okay, uh, IoT I mentioned before is the Internet of Things. Anything connected to the Internet, and it just seems like now everyone's going crazy to get everything connected to the Internet. Uh, and some of those are really positive things. Uh, some are not. And unfortunately, the scramble to get everything connected uh, is forcing some of the companies, well, sort of forcing them to put security way down on their list. So their number one priority is to get things connected and they'll worry about security later. Uh, Watch is a really good example of that. You may have heard recently in the news uh, where a lot of um, military personnel overseas were using their uh, fitness watches to track things that was getting posted. I believe it was Strava, but I'm not positive on that. Um, and other people, uh, the bad guys, were using that to figure out where they were and were not supposed to know. And that's just kind of a weird social hack of this, but it, it's just another case where connecting the devices, the pros for that are just are awesome. And then you start figuring out later there are some consequences um, that were not considered before. In this example, uh, on the right-hand side, the, the two pictures that I show you is just something that I'm sure most people have not thought of, but... If you're a smartwatch uh, user and you go to the gym, in this case, and you're connected to their unprotected Wi-Fi, that device is at risk. That gym could easily be a coffee shop. It could be a, a mall, a store, anywhere you're in where it's unprotected. In a lot of cases, those smartwatches are reaching out through that Wi-Fi automatically. It makes your life easier. You don't have to worry about it. But unfortunately, most of those Wi-Fis are not secure. And so then you come back into the office with that watch and anything anybody could get on it. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, one of those things that I think we're just going to see more and more of. Hopefully we also see more and more security <laughs> added to the devices as they're brought online. Uh, also notice uh, in the picture on the left, the security camera. That's one already in uh, last year we we're starting to see a lot more attacks 
through these IP cameras because people like to see uh, what's on the cameras on their phones outside of the office or on a computer from a remote location, maybe their house or one of their other offices, so they can keep an eye on things. It's a fantastic feature, but unfortunately to do that, you've got to connect to the internet. And a lot of times the security camera people are not doing that very securely. They're getting a lot better. That was one of the first attack vectors and, and they are responding pretty well. Variety, here's where it gets into definitely some new stuff that I'm betting most people have not heard of. Uh, I think both of these things are going to increase. Uh, one is, is going to be a lot worse uh, than the other. Uh, Doxware, also referred to as extortionware, and then crypto mining, which I won't go into crazy detail because it's really, really complicated. Uh, the one I think I see being the worst by far is extortionware or doxware. And this is where a ransom uh, where a user or hacker will not just encrypt your files, they'll actually take stuff. And almost like the one uh, you saw uh, for the phone earlier, they take it and they threaten to release it. So in this case, unfortunately, if they're successful in taking things off network and they have them now, the best backups in the world are not going to save you from them releasing them. And this is not new, um, but the availability of the tools for hackers is getting new. And the other thing is they're getting much, much better at hiding the traffic of exporting those files. Because up till now, that's what's kept this uh, really hard for people to do. Because most networks are pretty good, firewalls, at detecting when a lot of data is going out and shouldn't be. Maybe during hours where it shouldn't be. That's actually uh, fairly easy to, uh, to track and monitor. So that's why a lot of times uh, the ransomware people will come in and encrypt files. There's no traffic. Well, if they want to actually take files then they, uh, they need to get them off your network, and that's going to go out through the firewall. They're, they're getting very good at this. Uh, the Sony attack, this was, that was actually several years ago, and it was a state-sponsored attack. So that one was not for money. That was to keep uh, Sony from releasing a, a movie that, if I remember right, I think it was North Korea, was not a big fan of. They had heard what the movie was going to be about. It was not going to paint them in a, a flat, as very flattering light. And so they uh, had a state-sponsored attack on Sony. It was successful. They released, uh, I think, five or six Sony movies before they were ready to be released. Uh, it was a huge deal, and, and that was years ago. Obviously at a big scale, but like we see with a lot of things, it trickles down now to the rest of us. Kind of scary. Uh, crypto mining, I'm guessing most of you, you may not know how it works or exactly what it is, but you've at least heard of Bitcoin and how crazy the uh, pricing and everything is going on that. Well, on the back end uh, is something called crypto mining. And that in itself is not negative. It has to be done. That's just how it works. The, blo the blockchain has to be um, fed, if you will. And it's done by crypto mining. Crypto mining eats up a lot of processor power and also some electricity. So hackers are taking advantage of other people's computers that they can take control of to do crypto mining. That is where it becomes a bad thing. The uh, thing that happened just towards the end, or I guess became more public just towards the end of last year, so 2017, was the fact that some people figured out how to do this through web browsers. So they didn't even have to install software on your machine. You would just be on their website, and in the background, your machine would start doing crypto mining for them. You'd have to have been pretty sharp um, to see that happening. And the, the really interesting thing about this one is, uh, this, I think this one will take off, <laughs> positive and negative. The positive side is, some sites are legitimately posting this as, hey, we won't show you any ads, you won't have any pop-ups, as long as you let us kind of borrow a little bit of your processing power while you're on this site. It's actually kind of cool when you think about it. Um, most, co most computers at home that people have, if you bought them in the last two or three years, are way faster than anything they're actually going to use. Uh, you're rarely going to max out that horsepower. So you're allowing somebody to use a little bit of that uh, to feed the blockchain, to help uh, <laughs> prop Bitcoin up, so to speak. And the only thing it's costing you is a little bit of bandwidth and a little bit of processing power, and a little bit of uh, electricity if you're, if you're allowing it to go on after hours, or sometime when you're not actually on the computer and wouldn't normally be, uh, be using it. 
but very interesting. Uh, of course, this is brand new. Everybody's doing it in a different way, and there are lots of people out there screaming that uh, you have to warn us <laughs> when you're going to do this. Um, other people screaming, hey, I'm tired of ads, so yeah, I'll, I'll do this in a heartbeat. But something absolutely to keep an eye on. Very interesting. And as I promised, we do have time for this. Got a couple minutes left. On the positive side, there are things being done, obviously, <laughs> on, on how to fight back. Um, artificial intelligence is kind of, I wouldn't say at the top of the list, I think it's one of the most exciting areas. Unfortunately, it's got a ways to go. Uh, but the gist of this is machine, you're using machine to fight machine. So instead of people monitoring logs, people looking for exploits, uh, which obviously compared to machines were a lot slower. So we use artificial intelligence in programs and in services to fight the machines. It actually learns what's coming next. Because as most people realize with ransomware, it, it's totally a catch-up game. Uh, the bad guys change. Here's a new attack. We got to figure out what it is. We got to react to it. And then by then, of course, they're on to the next thing. Well, AI that's being developed in some of these defenses is actually getting really good at bridging that gap. So it's, I wouldn't say instantaneous, but it's pretty quick in, uh, in moving itself to new attack vectors. And then also they're getting to the point where they're starting to predict, which is really, really nice. And I'm, I'm kind of moving fast through this because I want to get to the last thing. I think it's really, really important. Um, this is interesting, though. Some new risk engines are coming out uh, that can actually, if you look there in the second set of parentheses, they can actually base access and security on your customer or you being the customer's behavior. So I've even seen them now where how you hold your phone is taken into consideration. So it's not just a username and a password, but it's looking at, okay, wait a minute, this person's never doing this while they're driving down the road at 40 miles an hour. It sets off a red flag. Very, very cool. And the last thing here I'll leave you with is, and I hope this really hits home, get used to multi-factor. Password-only authentication is, is going to continue to decline. More and more things, if you use banks, financial institutions, other things online, you, you've probably already experienced this. It seems like a real pain at the beginning. Once you've done it for a while, it, it's actually not that big a deal, but just get used to it. It's so much safer. Um, Multi-factor requires two of these three things. And, and I won't go into crazy detail, but it's kind of important that you realize this, and you'll know whether you're using a secure site based on how closely they're following this. It's based on two of these three things. Something the user has, so it, let's just use the simplest example, your phone. Something you know, so again, username, password, maybe a pen, and something you are or something you are. So it may be facial recognition, that's kind of new and eh, not quite great yet, but, but it's getting there. Uh, fingerprint, those are becoming more and more common. Voice recognition, more and more. Uh, retina, that's kind of something out of the movies, but but people are starting to use it, believe it or not. Um, it's kind of cool. To be multi-factor, you have to have two of these, and they have to be in different categories. And the reason I want to make sure I emphasize that is a lot of times someone will say multi-factor on a site, and they ask you for a username, password, and then the answer to a secret question. Well, those are all three in the same category. That's something you know. So that doesn't really qualify as multi-factor. And I won't go into the details of why that's important, but it is important, trust me. You want to be in two different categories. So um, the best I've seen so far uh, is when you log in using a username and password, something you know, and they send you a code to your phone. So the only way you're getting in is if you physically have that phone. That's very nice. Uh, Ubi, Yubi is another company that has uh, some keys now. They're really small, like dongles that you would stick in the computer. That proves that you are who you say you are. Very inexpensive and very cool if you want to go out and check those out. Um, and you can also email me for any of the things I'm mentioning that are not in the slides. And I'll be happy to follow up. Uh, I think we're right at 30 minutes. 
and I apologize for not leaving uh, some time for questions. I didn't see any pop up during the presentation. Um, so hopefully uh, you can just email those to me or if you just want more information or want to throw something by me and ask if I've heard of it, I'd be more than happy to do a little digging for you. Uh, my name is Pete Amborn. I'm at DWD Technology Group. Uh, my email is listed there along with my phone number. And again, really appreciate your time and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.